possible too. Okay, great. So, uh, so we're going to pick up where we left off yesterday, which was just simulating single particles in uh, in the EIC detector in the EPIC detector. So we had um, the last thing we did was was sort of create this uh, um, simulation with uh, with two electrons per event, just because we can look at multiplicities of two events. And they were all going in the negative end cap direction. So from, I picked an angle of 135 to 177 degrees scattering angle. So that's the negative um, end cap from the electron point of view. Um, and all the way to pi in phi um, and between one and 10 GeV in momentum. Um, so we, uh, we created a file that was this, uh, this EDM for HEP root file that has all of the output from the simulation. So that will include all of those readout collections for hits, uh, will include truth information. Uh, we were just about to get started on looking what's inside that file. And I'm just gonna refresh this page here. That doesn't work on Mac, there we go. Hopefully. I see. So, um, and I'm going to load this file which we downloaded yesterday into this um, into this uh, CERN root interface, uh, JavaScript-based interface, which works in the browser. So that's what's inside this file. This is going to be the same in every file that you run, whether it's single particles, whether it's PCA eight events, which we're going to do next here in a minute or in five minutes. Um, you're going to get this as output. And the information that you likely would want to look at is in this events table, right? In this events tree. Um, so those of you familiar with root trees, you'll probably recognize this kind of structure. Um, so there's different collections of event or, or collections of information for these events. So we've got MC particles. Those are Monte Carlo truth particles. That's the actual information, the true information for the, um, the simulation, um, as opposed to typically what we would compare this with is reconstructed information, things that we derive from hits that are detected in um, simulated detectors. And then you have all of these collections here with hits. That's hits or the signal that this event left in certain detectors. Um, We've looked at this vertex barrel detector a number of times already. So the vertex barrel hits are going to be what is left a signal in the vertex barrel detector. That's the, the tracking detector that sits closest to the beam pipe, closest to the interaction point. For each of those hits, we have a number of variables that we can look at. Um, and you'll see that every hit collection has sort of the same information positions, momentum. Um, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can measure momentum in those detectors, um, but position is typically something that we will get out of a detector. If, if a certain pixel in the vertex barrel detector lights up, we will know where that position, where that pixel is located, and that will give us a position in X, Y, and Z. Momentum we will sometimes get for detectors that have uh, directional sensitivity. We won't necessarily get the momentum magnitude, but we'll get the direction um, from the momentum vector. So we can go through this. There's lots of different collections here. Remember that we were shooting these electrons into the negative end cap. So I'm also going to pay attention to this negative electromagnetic colorimeter collection, end cal, e cap, end, e, e cal, end cap, n for negative hits. Um, because these are colorimeters, electromagnetic colorimeter, it doesn't typically have any direction sensitivity as opposed to the tracking detectors. So there's no momentum here. This relation, what, what are those two leaves? They are at, at size and cell ID. Uh, size and cell ID. Um, so what we do is with every individual sense development, like a pixel in a tracking detector or a block in a colorimeter, we assign a unique number. And cell ID is the number. Size here is just going to be how many hits are there in this detector. So if I double click 
single click on this is going to tell me uh, is going to give me a histogram of the number of hits in this detector. Unfortunately, how how did I hide this again? Wait. More hide floating me. There we go. Um, so there was one event here, one event because this bar has a, a height of one that had what's this 145 hits in this detector. Um, there were two events here, because this bar has a height of two, that had between 16 and 17, excluding 17 hits, so, so 16 hits in this detector. So that's just what size is. It's just effectively showing how many um, events are, uh, how many entries, how many hits there are. Remember, we simulated just 10 events. So we have, uh, for each of those 10 events, we have a number of hits in those detector. And for most of them, it's all, you know, larger than 16, and it goes up to 140. If I look at cell ID, um, that's going to look quite different, and it's it's intended to be a, a number that you shouldn't necessarily be able to interpret. Um, so so we're not going to look at this histogram, but I am going to look at let's see at this now. This works apparently not on Mac. Oops, no. If you press Control and you click on this, it's supposed to show the values. Um, this probably works for those of you who are not on, on Macs. Um, I'm going to try to figure out which it is. Uh, uh, yeah, keyboard is also not from, from Mac there. So. Yeah. So, okay, here it is. If you do, uh, a right click and then you do dump, then it will actually show you the values um, after you do open all. So those are the values that it actually has in there. So this is the cell ID for the first hit in the first event, event zero, cell ID, cell ID, and so on. I can do the same thing with the energies and it's going to show me after I click open all, the energies for each of those hits. These are all energies in, uh, um, in units of GeV, so you know, this is, for example, a 1 MeV energy. This is a 2 MeV energy, 0.3 MeV energy, and so on. OK. So that is is what in our, is what in our, this is the hits that are in our um, negative end cap. What do you expect will happen if I look at the, the positive end cap? I look at the number of hits in that detector. If I create a histogram there, what's it going to look like? Probably no hits at all. No hits at all? Like, I mean, it's not really fair because you all have it right in front of you. You can actually do this before I do it, right? So no hits at all. Let's see. So maybe not exactly no hits. Um, six events have zero hits. And there's two events with one hit, and then um, two events with three and four hits. But fewer hits than um, are in the, the end cap in the negative direction, because of course, in this simulation, we were, we were shooting those electrons into the negative direction. Um, you'll probably see that the energy here is very small. But it's also 10 to the minus three. Um, so so there's, there's no real energy deposited in that vector. So that's how we would look at these uh, at these hits. Um, we can look at the, the position of the hits in the vertex barrel detector. Um, if I look at the position in the Z direction, what do you expect to see there? In the Z direction. So these are my, my barrel detectors that are sort of around. The central beam direction, negative. negative, okay. So we see negative hits. So um, if I were to shoot my electrons into the positive direction, then we would see positive hits here. Um, there's actually um, not necessarily that many hits here as, as you would um, expect ordinarily, in part because we're looking at the barrel dire direction. 
some of the hits that are going into this negative direction, they're actually going to miss the barrel entirely. They're just going to see, they're just going to go into the, the end caps and they're going to miss the barrel cylindrical detectors that are around um, the beam pipe. Um, but we don't have any vertex end cap detectors because that's, you know, that would be inside the beam pipe that doesn't work. But that's not something we are going to do at least. Um, nothing doesn't work. It's just, Depends on how much you want to pay for it. Um, okay. So that's what we have here in these structures, these hit structures. These are useful if you want to figure out um, what your detector is going to see at the very at lowest hardware level. You know, what is going to be the rate of events or the, the rate of hits in each detector block in a colorimeter? Am I expecting to see, see one signal every second? Am I expecting to see a, a one megahertz rate of signals firing in that detector? That will then affect what I'm going to do with that detector, how I'm going to read it out. Now we want to compare this with the, the, the true information. So we have these positions of these, these hits, um, but that's actually just the position at the center of the colorimeter block that lit up, or it's the position at the center of the pixel. It's not necessarily the position that the track had when it hit that pixel, which will not be in general right at the center. Um, so that's what is stored in this uh, MC particles um, branch. So that's where there's true information. Um, this stores information much more frequently than, um, it's, than uh, you know, it's going to be useful to look at here. Um, one thing that it does store is it also stores the very original event that we started from. The, the original track, the two electron tracks that we threw into the detector. Um, and this is typically what we're going to try to do here is uh, um, compare or reconstruct the quantities with the actual original um, energy or the original momentum that the track had when it was thrown into the detector. So in this case, we could look at, uh, uh, this is going to be hard to do in this interface, but um, we could look, for example, at the Momentum, uh, this does look very nice. Um, well, let's look at uh, this PDG column, um, which contains all of the particle data group codes for tracks that have been stored here. The first two, which have this code 11, that indicates that this was an electron. Um, for those of you familiar with the numbering scheme for particles, this is a standard numbering scheme in Monte Carlo event generators in Monte Carlo codes. So this is going to be the same for every Monte Carlo um, context that you're ever going to use. 11 is always going to be an electron. 22 is going to be a gamma. Uh, minus 11, it's the opposite of an electron. So it's, an, it's a positron. Um, so this will indicate which particle this was. Um, and so these first two, and these first two, and I can go and go through all of the first two are always going to be our original two electrons that we started from. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to follow what I think you said earlier. Is this because this is the true particle information, like what's not registered by the detector, but actually what's being tracked through Gion? Mm -hmm. Is it sampling it at each step in Gion, or is this just certain information about? It's sampling it at certain points. Okay. Um, so in particular, in this case, and we can we can tell it to save much more than just this, than you know, twenty events here or twenty one um, uh, tracks here. Um, but by default, it is just going to store the initial tracks mm -hmm. and the tracks mm -hmm. that are generated inside the um, the region that is that is uh, delineated by the electromagnetic colorimeters. So that means that any secondaries that are created in tracking detectors are going to show up here. Any, you know, some of these are going to be Bremsrollen. Um, any kind of hard photons that are radiated are going to show up here, um, but not things that are generated in electromagnetic colorimeter showers, because then we have a lot more particles show up here. Uh, but those are all things that you could change actually through the, the DD sim parameters even. Like where you can change where it, it samples that information? Or? You can change how often it will write this um, and, and for which events, and you can change the region over which 
you know, you could increase this to go even uh, include the electromagnetic colorimeter, and then it would write a lot more yeah. particles there. So, thank you. Um, one way to change it, if I go back here, which is often done, is if I go back to the command. Let's, this was the. This was not the command. Um, you know what? I'm not going to find this command that we used last time. So let me just pull it up. Uh, so we used this command here, right? Um, let me copy this over in here. There we go. Um, one way in which we can immediately modify this is we can say, for example, I want to only store in that empty particles table particles that have a minimal kinetic energy of, let's say, one EEV. Um, this is going to suppress all of the particles that are generated inside the simulation, except for the ones that were part of the initial event record. So those two electrons are still gonna be there. All the other ones are gonna be suppressed. So we could run that simulation. That would give us in our, um, in our root file here, only the first two events. So that would give us the original event record only, nothing that is generated inside the detector. So that's one way in which you can actually use that kind of selection criteria. Okay, so we've looked at this, at this uh, particles. The, the truth record. Um, we've looked at these uh, hits collections. Um, so one of the things you can do um, is uh, is explore this more for your detector. Um, but I actually want to move on to a next step, which is going to be looking at physics events rather than artificial particle gun events. So we're going to do that, and uh, and then there will be an activity based on that. Okay. So when we run simulations, there's this other type of simulations that we run, which are based on physics event generators. So there's a certain number of DIS events that we expect and they look a certain way. And so what we do is we generate large samples of DIS events. Um, what this, what we start from here is, um, the, the, the final state of the event generator becoming the initial state for our detector um, simulation. Um, that means that essentially we simulate the heart scattering electron proton and the electron goes somewhere. There's pions that are generated. There's somewhere some, some baryon that must come out as well, some um, uh, target remnant. Um, and all of that we take and place it at the interaction vertex and then have it go through our detector simulation. So that's what we want to do with, um, with DD sim. Now generating these DIS event files takes a while. It uh, certainly takes a while if you need 100 million of those DIS events that can certainly keep someone busy for a couple of weeks. Um, so we have, so we have uh, large samples of those files available for the collaboration, which you can uh, you can download here. Um, but I'm not going to go through that. We're just going to generate a small number of events here ourselves because you know it's it's after all a, a a summer school where all of you are interested in learning about um, about generating DAS events. I hope so. We're going to skip to creating our own input files directly with PCI8. Um, now that leads us to one caveat that we have to start with. And then you can do this with, uh, with Pythia 8, as we're gonna do here, um, you could use any event generator. So maybe you want to generate events with, um, I don't know, who, who is working with a particular Monte Carlo event generator? Gen? Gen, Gen, Gen M. Gen M? Gen M8. Okay, that would work. Um, any other event generators people are thinking of using? Herwig, yeah, you can use Herwig. Um, uh, how does Herwig do EP? I 
No, no, actually. I, I don't. <laughs> I was just, just looking at that um, the other day. It's like, does, does Herwig do EP rather yeah. well? Um, I, I don't know if anyone in EIC has 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 explored using Herwig in, in a lot of detail. So, um, so I'm not sure if Herwig is going to give DIS event, but you know, there's many event generators. Um, now, one thing that all those event generators have in common is they're taking a particle, they're scattering it off a particle, and those are particles that are in head-on collision mode. That is not how the EIC interaction region looks. The EIC interaction region is at an angle. So you can kind of imagine that if we have particles going head-on and we throw that into our detector simulation, that's not going to give us the right. We need to make sure everything is rotated so that we have a crossing angle. Um, and there's additional factors that need to be taken into account because if we say we have a 10 GeV electron that hits a 100 GeV proton, it's not going to be 10 GeV for every electron. It's not going to be 100 GeV for every proton. It's maybe going to be smeared a bit with some resolution on the electron side. It's going to be smeared a bit with some resolution on the, on the proton side. Um, there's going to be beam size effects. These are not perfectly thin beams. They're actually going to have some beam divergence, some, some size to that beam. So those are all things we have to include in our simulation. It actually makes a meaningful difference, especially that, that crossing angle actually is, is, uh, is, is very important to um, to have right um, or to include, otherwise you get uh, a very strange um, results that don't correspond to reality. Now we don't want to rewrite all event generators because we don't have the time for that. So what we do instead is we, we use something called an afterburner where we take head-on collisions, we just boost them, rotate them and boost them into the frame that corresponds with what we would get in a, uh, um, a, uh, um, in, in an interaction that is at this crossing angle. So we can do that on any event generator. If you have a head-on collision event generator, um, we can apply this afterburner and uh, modify the HEPMC input files to get mm, event, uh, get HEPMC um, files that then uh, have that rotation applied. I'm not gonna go through that because in Pythia 8, we can do something better. Because Pythia 8 is so important for us, we have actually gone ahead and uh, implemented all of those um, beam effects in Pythia 8 in the event generation code it itself, because it allows us to do this in a little bit more detail even than is, available, than is possible in, uh, um, in a uh, afterburner code. So that's what we're gonna use here. Oh, I don't know why this crashed. Oh, I know why this crashed. Source of detector setup, there we go. Um, so what we're gonna do here is, we don't need this anymore. We don't need any of this anymore. Um, and we don't need all this text cluttering up things here. So we're going to get the code that describes our um, event generation with Pythia 8, just stored in another Git repository. And I'm just going to git clone that into this directory I'm in here. Yeah, C, EIC, sim, U, beam, effects. Right. Pretend that you saw that. Okay. Rewind. Um, so we're just gonna git clone everything inside this directory. Um, there shouldn't be anything in that directory. The, the directory shouldn't exist yet for you um, as it did for me here just a second ago. Um, so we're going to get something like this. Um, we now have this directory, EIC, SIMU, beam effects that we can go into. We can also look at this here in the panel. You'll see there's a Pythia 8 directory. There's some additional code that it has written here. Um, Pythia beam shape, um, EIC beam shape. There's some steer files, which describe, for example, for 10 GeV by 10 
by 100 GeV. Let me maximize this here. It describes, for example, one mode in which we're going to run our interactions 10 GeV on 100 GeV beams in what is called um, high divergence mode, one way in which we optimize the beam conditions. And there's various things that are defined here, particle types. What's 11 again? Electron, yeah. Uh, 22, 12, that's a proton. Got the proton, that gets 100 uh, GeV. The electron gets 10 GeV. And then here we give the beams their, their parameters. These are things that come from the accelerator design group. They tell us, well, the beam sigma and the momentum for the protons is going to be this in X and Y and this in Z. And for the electrons, it's going to be this in X and this in Y and this in Z. Um, there's a reason why the electron beam might look differently, uh, have a different width in the X and the Y direction, because of course, our, we have a preferential plane in our Accelerator is a horizontal plane. And then we have some vertex spreading in X and Y that's related to the crab cavities that, that rotate the, the bunches into the right direction. So these are numbers you shouldn't have to worry about. Um, one number I am going to worry about is I'm going to reduce this a little bit. Um, so we're not going to sit here until 3.30 um, just generating events. Um, so we're going to just simulate a thousand events. Um, let's say, let's say I want to calculate something to a certain precision. Um, let's say I want to calculate, calculate something to an overall event parameter. I want to calculate it to about 1% precision. What's sort of a good ballpark number of events that I would, would probably start with. 1% precision. What number of events would that correspond to? And it relates to the, the polarization talks that you've seen. Chip and, and Oleg covered that, I think, Oleg too, right? So, so how does an uncertainty on an experiment where you have a certain number of events, how does that uncertainty scale with the number of events? Square root of n. Right? If the statistics are good, and yeah, there's there's all kinds of caveats. So if it's square root of n, and I want a one percent precision, what will that tell me about the number of events? That's probably good to start with. For which number is the square root of the number of events about one percent of the number itself? Oh, I'm sorry. Almost. More than that. More than that. More than a thousand. 10,000. 10,000, yes. So square root of 10,000 is 100. That's 1% 1 of, uh, of 10,000. So that means that 10,000 is 100 squared. Um, so, so if I simulate 10,000 events, that would give me a precision of about 1%. So let's start with, uh, with 10,000 events. That's probably going to be reasonable. Um, so those are our, uh, this is what is called a steering file for these simulations. Uh, or for these event generations, um, we can actually go and scroll down even further because you can you can find everything here. You know, talking about uh, um, uh, LHA PDF earlier, um, we can actually use LHA PDF um, and define a specific set of PDFs in the simulation. Uh, so in this case, that's commented out, so it's not going to do anything here. Um, we uh, we're using the CTEC five L. PDF, which is the default. Um, for the lepton, we of course don't use a PDF, um, or, or in this case, we don't use a PDF. Um, we're defining weak boson exchange where we use T channel and gamma Z. Um, so this is going to give us both um, gamma and Z exchange in the DIS process. And then we're turning on some other parameters here. Um, which I don't even necessarily know all the details about. So some selection cuts, in particular, this one here, for example, is uh, we select the minimum Q square of 10, 10 GeV squared. Uh, we, could, uh, we could turn this to a different value. We could set this to, to one, we could set this to 100, 
um, you'll see that those are numbers that uh, that will come back um, in in some of our standard data sets if you're um, involved in some of the EIC studies. So I'm going to leave this at um, at ten. Uh, I'm just going to scroll through the other ones here um, just to show you that there's you know there's other stuff that you can look at, but uh, um, I'm not going to change any of this. Just leave Q square, minimum Q square at 10. Okay, so that's our steering file. Um, and I'm gonna try to hit, go back to the instructions now. <clears throat> so we're in this, uh, let's see, which directory are we in here? So we're in this directory, EIC simu beam effects. Um, and there's a Pythia 8 directory that we still need to go into. And that's where all of those Pythia um, codes live. What this is, is really just a front end code to write HEPMC events from Pythia 8 based on those, uh, those inputs. So I'm going to um, compile these front end codes with make. It's going to sit there for, I don't know, 30 seconds. While it's compiling this, um, Pythia 8 is installed inside this environment. And this is really just linking these front end codes with that Pythia 8 that is living inside the EIC shell environment. There we go. And I should have given you two new executables, run beam shape and run beam shape HEPMC. Run beam shape. HEPMC is the one that's going to write HEPMC files. So that's the one we're going to run. Run beam shape HEPMC. Now, if we just run this, um, it's going to complain. We need to provide it some arguments. So we're going to provide it some arguments. Um, we're going to give it uh, the steering file that we just modified. Um, and so it's going to be run beam shape HEPMC. The steer file is DAS EIC beam 10 X 100. Now we have to give it a number of, oh, I forgot to high divergence mode, 10 by 100. And we have to tell it again that it's high divergence by passing the number one. That's explained in the readme. Then 100 for the um, hadron energy. 10 for the lepton energy, minus 0 0.025 milliradians for the crossing angle. That's the one that's important. And then we're going to give it a Pythia. This is going to be too long to write. So just copy that from here. <laughs> copy. And I copy that file name there, and then copy the output file name, which is going to be our HEPMC file. So this is going to give us, uh, and, and okay, let's let's make sure we are correct here because this is not a minimum Q square of one. This is a minimum Q square of ten. Just to make sure our files are reflecting this. So that's going to generate four events. Going to show the nice banner. Um, let me make this bigger, yeah. It's just gonna put it in maximum size here. It's going to go through, too big. Wait, what did I change now? Number of events. Huh. Oh. oh, actually, um, sorry, it actually completed just fine. Um, it just it, it completed faster than um 
that I uh, I remembered from last night because I changed the number from a million down to uh, yeah. uh, to ten thousand. So it has actually done ten thousand events. Um, it just gives a summary of uh, of errors it encountered, and it at one point encountered one error, which which just happens with uh, Monte Carlo event generators. So what this Monte Carlo event generator does is actually um, so so what's a Monte Carlo method in 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 essence? What was it originally developed for? Integration. Integration, yeah. The only thing this does, in, in essence, is, is calculating this number. It's calculating the integral that gives us a cross-section for the process that we've selected here. For this DIS process, uh, electron protons um, with T-channel, uh, gamma, and Z, so neutral current DAS, it calculates that cross section. The fact that it generates events is, is entirely coincidental. The fact that we get those events is sort of nice for the experimentalist, but really the Monte Carlo method in itself just calculates that integral over the cross section, the total cross section for this process. So that's our cross section here in millibarn. And this is the uncertainty. Um, what's our relative uncertainty? on this cross section, about a percent. So that makes sense because we did 10,000 events. Okay, questions? Cross angle minus zero, zero, 20. So we used a crossing angle of, of minus 0 0.025 because the, the crossing angle in the EIC is going to be 25 milliradians. And as it happens, it just needs a minus sign to get the direction right. Um, just experience. There's 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 uh, two ways to figure out your sign. Um, one of them is to think about it and have it wrong, and then the other way is to just try it and, until you get it right. Um, so yes, the minus zero point zero twenty five is the right angle. Yeah. The elements you said shown for you and for me is different. Yeah. So this. This is a random process, right? So the integration through Monte Carlo is random. There's, there's good reasons why um, there's error messages sometimes shown in this, uh, in this uh, generation of events because it might pick a Monte Carlo point randomly outside of a range that is, um, that is physically allowed. That's why it's showing these error messages. Um, and because it's random, it's gonna be different for you. It's gonna be different for anyone here. Um, so that's why they can be different error messages too. I think for me, it, sh it is showing the initialization fail. Okay, so then that is a very different message. Does that anyone else get an initialization failed error? Because you changed the file name. So, so maybe, uh, so, so double check if you have um, sort of the same command line as here, maybe there's some differences. Um, okay. Uh, Hold up on those yeah. same errors. Do we do we have to 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 beg those or just just leave them as they are? Like um, the errors you as long as this just happens for one time in ten thousand events, that's fine. You you would worry about this if um, so. So for example, how can we get more errors? That's that's what I usually not ask myself, um, but. This is one we're gonna to have to worry. Let's say I pick my um, DIS interaction of four uh, or five GeV beams on 41 GeV beams, right? And let's say I want a minimum Q squared of 1000. So minimum Q squared of 1000 for a five GeV and 41 GeV beam is going to be it's going to be really hard to get a thousand GV squared as a Q squared, the momentum transfer for those beam energies. In fact, it is, if I'm not mistaken, it, it's uh, kinematically impossible. Um, and I am really hoping that um, Pythia is going to scream loudly about that by creating lots of error messages. So, or by failing at least many times here. 
So I'm going to go and simulate this five by 41 with a minimum Q square of a thousand. So this is five on 41. And this is high divergence again, five and 41. Okay. So all 1 million times, it just aborted because it can't generate any events. So this is when you would start worrying about it because then you've clearly done something where you have to step back and think, you know, why, why are there so many errors? Well, it's because it's kinematically not a possible reaction. Yep. Why are you defining the beam energies in the run card and then also in the argument for simulating? Yeah, that's not ideal, but- uh, So wait, which one does it follow? Uh, it, it follows both of them for different parts of the code. So, um, so what's happening is the run card gets passed to Pythia 8 and is used by Pythia 8 internally. Right. The additional beam effects that we're doing, that we're applying are done sort of by this front end code that, that then calls Pythia 8 and it doesn't necessarily have access to that run card. Okay. Right now. So, so not ideal, but it's what we have. Okay, other questions? So, um, Let's go back to uh, the first command. I'm just going to run this again here because you know, apparently it runs pretty quick for or, uh, or 10,000 events. So now I actually got a few more errors here. Um, but again, still there are like 100 errors. I don't think I would be too worried about that. Uh, you see, I got a slightly different cross section now because it's a random evaluation. It's a, it's a Monte Carlo evaluation of this total integrated cross section. I get four. 10 to the minus five millibars. So this is for a minimum Q squared. It's not this file here, but for a minimum Q squared of 10. Um, in EIC, what's going to be the um, the luminosity of the interaction of the electron and the, the, um, and the proton beams. You've seen this number already a number of times. 10 to the minus 34? 10 to the 34. 10 to the 34, yeah. It's a large uh, cross-section, um, a large uh, luminosity. So, so 10 to the 34 units. Per centimeter per second, yeah. Um, what's the units here on the sigma besides being millibar? <laughs> so it's millibar is, is a surface area, right? So, um, so what we'd like to do now is of course say, well, this is our cross section. How do we get from this cross section to, um, wait, it's not per centimeter per second, it's per centimeter squared per second um, in the luminosity. Sorry about that. Um, so what we like to do now is figure out how many events are we going to get? DIS events, for example, these 10 by 100 events with a minimum Q square of 10 GV squared, how many events of those are we going to get per second once EIC is running? at a luminosity of 10 to 34 per centimeter squared per second. Little exercise for everyone here. How many of these events are we gonna get per second? <coughs> I'll let everyone calculate that. You know, maybe talk to your neighbor. And then of course, we've calculated this here for a Q, minimum Q square of 10. And I'm gonna ask you all to calculate it for a minimum Q square of one. So you're gonna to have to rerun the simulation or rerun the calculation of the cross section here. Um, if you run for a minimum Q square of one, are you gonna get a larger or a smaller cross section? Larger, right, because it includes also minimum Q square of 10. So it's going to be a larger phase space. So you're going to get a larger cross section. So that's going to translate into what a 
So more, events per more events per second. Yeah. So how many events per second are you going to get for a minimum Q square of one at 10 by 100 um, interaction energies and with a luminosity of 10 to the 34? We're not going to get 10 to the 34 on day one, but you know. Okay, so we calculate that one. Can you say the logic by decreasing the larger population? Decreasing the minimum Q square is, is expanding your phase space. So in a larger phase space, there's going to be a larger cross section for that reaction to be allowed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. So is there so one million events that will stop? And yeah, so you should get a similar screen like a voucher and I give you a summary giving you the cross section. But in the meanwhile, we can do this calculation. Yeah, like uh, that we can ask Chad. Well, everything is used. I don't hear that. The question, the question is, the question is that if you have a a cross section that's ten to the power of minus. So yeah, the integrating the of the of the the Centimeters squared. Yeah. Centimeters squared. Okay. It'll add these light breaks. Yeah. Just for the luminosity of those are small. Ah, that's a huge open. Yeah. Of course, we have the multi-slide. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, that's what I mean. Turn out that's what I mean. I've been trying to have to ask. Yeah, that's what I have a question. Okay, so this is a no, no, we haven't seen the error. Remember how to fetch it. Yeah, I gotta think about that. Okay, gotcha. No worries. Okay, so basically, this error is like exclusive. Yeah, so we can this to. Uh, oh, and I guess no space, many space, oh, yeah. like this that would oh, yeah, be yeah, also the reason. Yes, now. oh, yeah, but, yeah if yeah. you're creating a singularity, it's still using space on your system. Yes. Yes. You would change it. Um, you can install CVMFS and then it will just download everything directly. I know we're running against CVMFS. So. This is moving on in the second instant power. And we added 9,000 to the time frame. It doesn't actually affect the simulation. Oh, it's me. You can whatever randoms that you know, like with the settings group. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say so we can well but also so so that can find that process by the way cross section yeah that's this yeah. Uh, it's a thousand. Just showing you the cell. Is that a number? Yeah, I copy and paste. I said the wrong word. So yeah. It's a basic way that will start with a thousand. The cells. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. But, so you focus. So who got a, a rate for, for DIS events 10 by 100 for minimum Q square of 
1 GeV squared at a luminosity of 10 to the 34 per centimeter squared per second who's willing to share their thought process. Where's that eraser? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is on so how do you get to that from cross-sectional luminosity? Just multiply them together, right? So luminosity times cross-section gives you a number of events. That's what's that called? The, the goal. There's like technically like in, in the golden formula or something from Fermi, is that when Fermi's golden rule? Is that it? I yeah. think so. Um, there's like a matrix element in there typically still, but that we have already incorporated into the, the cross section, right? Um, so cross section times uh, luminosity. So now it's just a matter of keeping your, uh, your 10 to the minus, well, you, what's the cross section you get for a minimum Q square of one? 5.5, 5, 10 to the minus five? I got it. 10, okay, 5.5, 10 to the negative four. Um, and this is in millibarn. So milli is 10 to the minus three. What's one bar in centimeters squared? Is that 10 to the minus 24 per centimeter? That's okay, 10 to the minus 24. And then times our luminosity, which we're gonna pick as one 10 to the, Plus 34. Um, I really should have just used my regular calculator here, clearly. Uh, so, what do you get if you that multiply that all together? Five, 5.5 10 to the minus 6. Yeah. Okay, so that's the rate of DIS events. Oh, that's lower than I thought it was going to be. Uh, um, so, that's the rate of DIS events that we expect in our detector. Um, now, the other thing you can do with that is we can, um, instead of multiplying that with um, the instantaneous luminosity, is multiplying that with the total integrated luminosity. Just as a, a rule of thumb, the first year at EIC, we're going to take 10 inverse femtobarn. And the first and second year together, we're gonna take um, or, or what is it? The first three years together, you know, for for true high luminosity running, we're going to take a hundred inverse femtobarn. So a hundred inverse femtobarns, then it's just um, and you don't get a rate. But if you multiply that with uh, the the millibarn um, cross section there, then you should get the total number of events for this particular process. So that gives you an idea of how many um, how many of those events are created. So what was the answer earlier? Was the problem? I don't. I don't know. I didn't actually calculate. <laughs> <laughs> I multiply two together. It gets it's like a thousand or something. Yeah, yeah. it sounds it's like five thousand. Yeah, okay, they were five thousand. Yeah, five thousand. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. So I, I thought it was larger than yeah. uh, <laughs> than one because we're supposed to get a lot of DAS events. Yeah, yeah. Now, multiply this number oh. Are all of those events available for analysis? If if uh, if we were if we wanted to study the EIS events, um, it's is this you know are we done now, um, or or why did we write our detector simulation um, in in sim? What is that adding to this to this calculus uh, to this uh, algebra to this multiplication acceptance? Yes. So there's going to be a lot of these events that don't actually make it into our detector. Um, so when we have, uh, um, you, you can actually calculate with a minimum Q square of one and 10 by a hundred, you can sort of translate that minimum Q square into a scattering angle. So we're already imposing a certain scattering angle on the electron, which, is, which we do because that is going to make sure that some of these events or a higher fraction of these events are actually going to end up in our detectors, which we can't put at zero scattering angle. They have to have at least a non-zero scattering angle. So a minimum Q square of, uh, of one GeV squared translates to a certain scattering angle, which again, I also don't know off the top of my head, but I could calculate it um, if we wanted to. But in any case, 
the message is that some of these events are not going to go into our detector, so they're not all going to be available. And that's why we have to run our simulations. That's why we are going to use these uh, FMC input files now and run them through our detector simulation to see what fraction of these events actually makes it into our detector. And then not just what fraction makes it into our detector, but which ones are we correctly identifying? Which ones are we, um, uh, which ones are, are we able to reconstruct? And then we can, of course, do studies like, well, if we reconstruct them, are we reconstructing them at the right mu squared, at the right scattering angle, at the right energy? So, so let's run this simulation on these events that we just created. Um, actually, just so I know I'm going to get the same results, let me also create some at one. And with a minimum Q square of one. That's not an error message. It's good to see cross section is here. There it is. Um, so one of the things you can do with the, these, these steering files, of course, now uh, you, you could start looking for um, uh, restricting this to, uh, to um, charge current events. So then you're going to be looking at charge current reactions. Um, you could tr try turning on and off certain other parameters here about how showers are, are treated, whether the, the decays are being included by, by PCR or whether you leave that up to JN4 to do. Um, you can change the PDF set is, that is being used. Maybe you want to use the, the fancy neural network and, and, and PDF um, set. So you could do all of this and see what the impact is. It shouldn't affect the cross-sections too much, um, but it might give you in certain ranges of X and Q square space um, different results, depending on where those... Um, those PDF sets are, are different. Uh, so let me uh, make sure that that file is there. So I have the file for minimum Q squared of one. And so now we're gonna run this through DDSIM. And I'm going to, uh, let's see, pull up the instructions here again, which actually don't have this um, in the right order. If I scroll up a little bit, there it is. So DD sim, I'm going to run minus minus compact file, detector, path, detector, config.xml. I'm going to limit this again to number of events, 10. Of course, if you're really doing this study, you would want to run this overall. 10,000 events, but as you can see, it, it's a little bit faster to run 10,000 events in your event generator than to run 10,000 events in the detector simulation. So we're gonna limit ourselves to the first 10 events here um, and, and leave running over 10,000 events as an exercise because that's gonna take you eight hours. Um, root, nope, I'm just copying things that I shouldn't be copying. Uh, the file here is Pythia 8 NCDIS 10 by 100. Minimum Q square of one, beam effects, high diff, F M C. That's it. And as output file, I'm going to use the same file name, Pythia 8, NCDIS 10 by 100, minimum Q square one, beam effects, crossing angle, high diff, and then EDM for HEP dot root. Make sure to use edm for app dot root as uh, extension there. There we go. So that should now run this entire simulation, all of those 10 first events that we created with PCI 8 through the um, detector simulation and should give us all of those hits that we need to then start the reconstruction. Yes. Yeah, I have some uh, error when I try to run the simulation um, on the mm -hmm. shape. So oh. I will be 
Yeah. Oh, um, there's okay. one other um one other Sorry. argument you could give as a as an output file, the HEPMC output yeah. file. Yeah, I try to that name and then sorry, what we yeah. Yeah. It's already yeah. Yeah. So isn't that beautiful? So he did all the work. Cloud, cloud. Yeah, before I ask you, he did better than just the cuts. He did all this hard work for you. Oh, you just have the fire. The sear file is different in your detector to do something about this timeline and strategy. Oh, um, Correct. it's run beam shape, have MC. That's it's for the same file. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah. uh, yeah. uh, yeah. 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 Should be so that is this. Oh, um, you passed the, the histogram output file. Oh, so yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So um, Bisia also yeah. writes um, some diagnostic information, some histograms. So don't use that as input to uh, to the simulation because that's not going to work. Yeah, we are trying to now try to what should be built. I can show you what should be built. What can name it something? Match design. Um. So if you get a segmentation fault, there's a couple of things that can go wrong. Um, one is, you know, use the HEPMC file as input. Um, another thing that could go wrong is maybe um, if, if you've restarted your terminal or so since yesterday, you might need to source that detector um, configuration again, source opt detector setup. Um, so that could be something else. Underscore or underscore. Yeah, that was the setup. What was it? Yeah, I thought I put it in the batch. Yeah. Now it's already. Okay. We should just run it out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go to the bottom. Take the beer. This is so in, in singularity, even if you set up the environment to run it automatically, singularity is to do it. So that's why, because most people have always used singularity, we never actually load it automatically because it's not required in singularity to do it explicitly anyway. So, but for these environments, yeah, we could do it automatically. That's what we have to do, right? Yeah. That's like the thing that you already guessed. And you change that. That's okay. So you just fit. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, that's okay. So you can cheat on them. Yeah. It will help fit the data. So how is everyone doing? Okay, thumbs up if you got uh, some output files. Walk around again. Okay, okay, so you're good. Oh, yours is running too. Okay. Uh, I'm doing this thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got enough. Yes, yeah, so pick whichever one you want. You can share the one. You know, put it in. Running first. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Everyone here. Are you okay?
Mm -hmm. You said you already had five. Yeah, I just did the okay. or did I open the deep browser. In oh, yeah. So I got a signal. It's funny because he told us all the beginning. And we were like, we don't need to do that. Yeah, so like the uh, like data sets, like 10.6. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do, but I use it. Oh, sorry. No, pi minus pi zero is out pending. I don't use the embedding for that. So if you press tab, it should know how to come back. So I'm mistaken. Oh, yeah, I'm just saying. I think I might have missed a step or find it recreated with Right, exactly. Oh, you can just finish it just in the directory. Let me just have to get it run. So a couple of things you can observe in the running of this simulation. Um, it takes a little bit longer per event because there's there's typically in DIS scattering, there's going to be more uh, particles per event. Um, we can actually look at uh, at the HEPMC file that we created as input here. Let's see. Um, this was the this one. Yes, it's a large file. It's fifty megabytes. But you know, let's <laughs> fingers crossed and make sure uh, see see how uh, how this opens here. Um, so that's our HEPMC input file. Each line that starts with E is the start of an event until the next line that starts with an E. And each line that starts with P is a particle in that event. So we can sort of count, well, we don't have to count, the number after the P gives the, the number of the particle. So we just go to the last P. So this had 22 particles in this event. Um, now that's not entirely accurate. It's not all particles that go into the detector. There are some internal vertices in there. Um, but still, this sort of sets the scale for these DIS events. They can have up to 22 um, particles per event some of which internal, so take half of that actually ends up in the detector. Um, so that's why it runs more slowly. The higher the energy, if we go to 18 by 275, um, there's going to be roughly, you know, it, it roughly scales with the center of mass energy of the collision. So if you go to a higher energy, you're going to have even more particles and stuff is going to run even more slowly. Um, you can also see here, you know, it starts off in this HEPMC file. It actually writes the cross section. Um, and for the very first event, well, the cross section and its uncertainty are the same because this is the very first estimate that the Monte Carlo method has for the cross section. Large uncertainty of 100%. For the second event, oh, it did already a little bit better on the uncertainty and it has modified the cross section slightly. If we go to the third event, well, it's done even better on the cross section. If we go all the way to the last event, you would find the exact value of the cross section and its uncertainty that you got on, on the command line um, by looking at the output of, uh, of Pythia. Um, there's some other information here about which particular PDF um, values and parameters it used. Um, you can look at which alpha QED, alpha QCD are used. And so for people that are interested on the connection with the theoretical side, this is, this is a very valuable um, piece of information um, if you wanted to look at certain events. Now back to our events here. So we have a, we have a file that was written, this edm for hep dot root file, which will have our hits in it, right? So let's go and do the same that we did before. We're going to download this file and then open it in um, in our root browser here. Let's see, where is this file? Pythia 8, uh, looks like the right one. So it looks the same, same structure to the file. We can look at the events. We can look at MC particles at the size of the particles. So there were even more, um, well, <laughs> This is the particles that are also get, getting created inside this, this region of the tracking detector. So maybe it doesn't exactly tell us what the size of the event record is. Um, 
So let's go to our vertex barrel hits. Um, so if I look at the position, the Z position of hits in the vertex barrel detector, what do you think we're going to expect now? Negative, positive? Where do you think it will be peaked? So this is a, this is a, will it be symmetric? No, it won't be symmetric. Why will it not be symmetric? So you can actually look at what you get, right? Um, we can actually uh, look at the hits. Well, okay, for 10 events, it's of course hard to make uh, many predictions, but um, if you were to simulate this with a larger number of, uh, of events, you would see that it isn't actually symmetric because we're looking at a specific type of event. We're looking at a, a, a DIS event where we have a, an electron of 10 GeV interacting with a proton of 100 GeV. And we, we've said we want a minimum Q square of, um, of 1 GeV squared. And we know that the cross section is large. It, actually, the cross section between a minimum Q square of, a, of 1 and a minimum Q square of 10 was actually fairly large compared to the cross section of, of higher Q squares. Actually, if you look at this, you were to look at the cross section as a function of Q squared, it falls off. Most of the integrated cross section is going to be in the low Q squared events. And that translates into most of the events being at low scattering angle from the electron point of view. So the electron is coming in, is going to scatter only slightly. Um, and the electron is coming in from the positive Z direction. It's scattering at the interaction region and it's scattering only slightly. So most of the electrons are gonna end up on the negative Z direction end cap calorimeter for this minimum Q square of, um, of one. If we require a minimum Q square of 10, what we're gonna do is we're going to require that electron to have a larger scattering angle. So minimum Q square of 10, now they're gonna start entering into the barrel detector. Minimum Q square of 100, we're going to be in the uh, electrons are going to end up in our plainly in our barrel detector. Minimum Q square of 1,000 for 10 by 100 here. Our electrons are going to have scattered under such a large scattering angle that they're going to end up in a positive end cap. So different detector regions are going to be um, uh, hit by different kinematics of events, which means that not all of our kinematics is going to be subject to the same acceptance, and in particular, then also efficiency considerations because they're going to see different detectors. Um, the opposite is true for the pions, in some sense, because those are now coming from the proton side. And so low Q squared means that there's less momentum transfer to the, to the, the, the quarks, and so while our target fragments are going in the forward direction in any case, those pions that are coming out of, of quarks that are struck are going to go mostly in the forward direction still. They're going to go into the end caps on the positive C side. Larger Q squared, well, now we're going to have pions that are going to be scattered over a larger angle. They're going to start entering the barrel. But crucial difference between the electrons and the pions is that there's only one electron. There's only ever going to, well, there's only ever going to be one primary electron. The pions, as they're separating from the, the, the target fragments, they're going to start creating more pions. So that entire region between the forward direction and the highest um, scattering angle pion is going to be filled with other hadronic stuff. So, um, so this is essentially what the events are gonna look like for different Q squares. Um, in, in our detector. And, you know, in 10 events, we can't necessarily see this as well here, um, but, uh, um, but that's sort of what we would look for in, uh, and, and for different sets of simulations for different minimum Q squares, you would see different distributions of events over different detectors for electrons and pions. Okay. Um, so all of this is what we would expect from an event when we actually run the experiment as well. One of the things we're trying to do with our, our simulation software is this is the event format, and this is the data structures that look like what you would get out of the experiment as well. So um, 
When we actually run the experiment, we're not going to have this MC particles truth information, but we're going to get a table with hits in, in this detector, a table with hits in this detector, a table with hits in this detector. And the analysis step or the reconstruction step of this event is going to be the same, whether it's for data or for simulation. So that's what we're going to go through next. That is actually run um, reconstruction of these events. Can I ask simple? Yes, sure. Uh, oh, someone else was raising it. You had a question. Yeah, go first. Oh, you don't have a question. Okay. So copy this file to my local uh, machine. So and in the, the side panel here, which I don't think I can increase the font size of, you can right click oh, okay. and then download. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let me go back now to the instructions here. Let's see what else do we have here. Um, ah, right, right, right. There's one other detail, um, which isn't as relevant right now, I think. Um, so many of the detectors in, in EIC use optical photons. Um, there's the, the rich detectors, which use Cherenkov light um, for detecting which particle type um, was detected. The Dirk detectors also use um, optical light. And DD SIM by default doesn't do optical photon tracking. Um, that's good because it allows us this to run fast because um, optical photons take a long time. If you did want to run with optical photons as well, um, there's a little extension NP SIM where NP is just historical or nuclear physics or something. Um, and, uh, and that will simulate optical photons as well. I'm not gonna have you go through that because optical photons can take up to 20 times as long as, no, no, as simulations without optical photons. So that's just a, a, a time sink right now. Is that the only major difference, Walter, or, or there are some other, I could, um, there, there are some other small differences, mainly related to um, energy thresholds in the tracking detectors. So DDSIM will set the energy threshold in the tracking detectors to one kilo electron volt, um, which means that it doesn't see synchrotron radiation and so on from, from the beam. Um, in NP SIM, that threshold is set to zero. So you also will see all like beam synchrotron radiation events in there. That's it's one of those. Yeah, that's for more detailed studies. But yeah. So, so when it says it's adding the optical photon physics, mm -hmm. is it adding in the physics list from Gion or is Gion not handling it at all? And the, the, the Python code is doing it. No, Gion is doing it. So, so it adds optical, optical photons for, for uh, yeah, it adds optical physics lists for uh, from yeah. Um in, in fact, it doesn't it doesn't add the optical physics list that, that's already enabled. It it um it enables the Cherenkov process that causes optical photons to be generated. Oh, okay. So um though actually did is um, the optical physics is enabled, there's just nothing that generates optical photons. <laughs> it's also fine. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, let's see, this is also already big. Okay, yeah. Um, so the last step that we're going to go through now is um, reconstruction of events. So now that we have our, our output file from simulation, which is in the same format that our um, output file from actual data taking will be, now we have to reconstruct that event from it. We have to take all of those hits and turn them back into the quantities ideally that are the same as what went into the event as a HEPMC input. Um, and what we do right now in simulations is studying how well that agrees and whether our detector technologies can be improved <coughs> and then implemented in simulation such that we get better measurements or uh, anticipated measurements of, uh, for example, energies and momentum, uh, momenta from, uh, from these initial particles. So with our DD sim, we produced a uh, simulated output file, simulated data. Now we're going to reconstruct that with a program called EIC Recon, EIC Reconstruction. No magic in our names here. 
Um, and that's going to give us a reconstructed file that's actually going to be in the exact same format as this again, except it's not going to have hits here as collection, but it's going to have clusters and reconstructed tracks and reconstructed charge tracks and inclusive kinematics and X and Q square uh, and everything you would want in a DIS event. So to do that, um, we've already set up our work environment. So we can actually skip this first part here and we can go right to this pre-built EIC recon that is going to be available um, in our environment. So if we go back to the EIC shell environment, there's the EIC recon command, which prints out exactly this, this help message that you see on the side there as well. Um, the EIC recon is something that works based on plugins and on factories, um, as I explained the first day. Um, so it's, uh, it's calling algorithms as needed and it's running them and reconstructing things based on those algorithms. What we do have to specify is an input file and it's gonna turn that into an output file. So, um, and we're going to go and apply that on a simulated data file. Um, now this gives us a quick reminder as to how we can run the simulated data file, but we already have a data file. We just simulated it with 10 events, right? So now we're going to run EIC recon on that simulated data file. EIC recon, uh, what did I call this? Pythia 8 NCDIS. EDM. Yeah, and it's the one that has EDM for F dot root as extension. Yeah. Zero beam uh, effects, da, 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 EDM for F dot root. Okay. So this file name. Uh, and if I run EIC recon on that, it's actually see that it's it's doing stuff, it's analyzing events, it's uh, we maximize this here. It's loading in the geometry, and it's gonna start doing things like reconstructing clusters, um, printing out some information, and there we go. Blah, blah, blah. We can assign a reaction to it. Reaction? Yeah, we can we could we could technically mm -hmm. assign the reaction to ICMN's P plugins. Right. Yeah. You get an error when you run EIC recon. Um, so is it a is it a, a fatal error? Yeah, it's um, so it doesn't find the file EDM. Oh, it's EDM for him. You have the title in the name. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, Sorry for that. so this is, this was just on 10 events, right? So um, <laughs> ideally you would want to do this on all 10,000 events we simulated in before, because what's going to be the uncertainty on something that's based on only 10 events? Quite high. That's, that's, a, that's a good number. Um, so a square root of 10 is, is pi, right? Square root of 10 is about 30%. So we're not gonna get any better results here than 30%, which is not usually um, very good. But you'll see that a file will have been created. Um, the default file name is pod.io output.root, um, which isn't all that, uh, that instructive as a file name, but let's download that. And again, open this in our, uh, in our root browser here. <coughs> Audio output the root. We've got our events. We've got now different structures in here. We've got clusters that have been reconstructed from hits. So that if we go, for example, to the ECAL. Um, so in which end cap did the electrons end up mostly for low Q squared? So Electrons coming in from the positive z-axis scattering into the interaction region, small scattering angle, so they end up in the negative end cap. So let's go to the ECAL end cap negative clusters. So we can look at the energy of a cluster here. 
ah, look at that. We've got a spike of uh, energies. Oh, we've got two spikes. We've got a spike of energies at zero. Um, that's actually clusters with nearly zero energy. That's probably um, Bremsstrom and photons that get split off um, from the electrons. But we have a, a spike of electrons at 10 GeV. Well, we're taking a 10 GeV beam at small scattering angle, low Q squared, the energy of the electrons that have scattered is going to be almost unchanged and is going to be only slightly smaller than 10 GeV. So that's our, that's our primary electron that's ended up here in our detector. If I wanted to reconstruct the, uh, um, the, the momentum and the Q square, um, or the, the Q square and the X, for example, of this DIS reaction, I would have a very easy time of figuring out what is our primary electron and then using that electron as, uh, uh, as the primary DIS electron to start my calculations from. That's something we're gonna to do tomorrow. Now, if we go to higher Q squared, our electron is not going to have lost only just a little bit of energy in this reaction. It's going to have backscattered over 90 degrees, 130 degrees. It's going to have lost energy. It's going to end up here in this region together with all the other pi offs. So suddenly it becomes really important that we identify this electron and distinguish it from maybe one of these pi offs. These could be pi offs. I don't know what they are. So, um, so that's where it becomes important to, um, to be able to, uh, to, to distinguish uh, electrons from pions. Here it's easy to identify pions. That becomes more difficult in, uh, in higher Q squares. So this is a cluster in our uh, electromagnetic end cap colorimeter. The other thing we can look at is tracking results. So well, let's go to our reconstructed charged particles. Oh, I see more. Reconstructed charged particles. This is going to come from our tracking system. That's going to come from that vertex barrel, but also our silicon barrel detectors or end cap tracking detectors. And here, you're going to look at the, I hope the energy is non zero. Okay, yeah, the energy is non zero. Um, so these are all of the reconstructed tracks. And you see that again, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten events, each with um, a particle, a reconstructed track that had an energy of 10 GeV. So those are our 10 primary electrons, which are all reconstructed correctly. Um, and uh, we can actually look at, uh, I think type, uh, type isn't filled, where is it? PDG, there it is. Um, we could look at the particle data group table. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, the scale doesn't allow us to see the 11, um, but those 10 electrons would all have assigned a code 11 um, because we right now force it to be the correct um, identification because we didn't simulate optical photons. Um, but that ultimately is going to give us or uh, or starting point now for the analysis. I was gonna say you can change the scale at the bottom. Yeah, unfortunately. Oh, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I need to fix the binning. Um, you said a cut on it? You no, know, so so this is a and this is a root of you can well. You can set the cut. But then you have to start typing things in the URL explicitly. That's not really what I want to show you. <laughs> okay, but it's 3.30, and I think that's probably a good time to stop here. So what we're going to start off from tomorrow is a larger reconstructed file with lots more events. And we're going to actually reconstruct X and Q squared from that input file. And we're not going to do that in this root interface, but we're going to use Python notebooks um, with... Uh, um, you know, which which don't require uh, um, don't require anything more than just some Python knowledge. Okay, good. Any questions? You think you got some idea now about how to run a full DIS simulation and you know get some results out? You now know how many DIS electrons you expect 
Yep. So uh, there, there are input settings for Pythia, right? Mm -hmm. Are those played around with at all or tested, or it, does the like the Epic collaboration essentially use one input setting file? Or we use one input setting file. Um, are are they being played around with? Well, they were being played around with until we generated just one large amount of the IS events based on Pythia input files, and we've been using that set of input files for the last, I think, two years. Okay. Um, actually, the input files predate the Epic collaboration even. Um, so, but, but these are DIS events. There's nothing that needs to change about that. Um, if, if there's anything that changes about it, it's probably better understanding of the accelerator and maybe some changes to the beam effect parameters. But, but the main effect there is the crossing angle and that hasn't changed. Um, it might make sense to rerun some of it with, with newer shower models, like newer fast jet, um, yeah. uh, jet um, parameterization and so on. But no, it's not going to change the conclusions that we're going now. So this does not require like an afterburner. But like no, uh, PCIA 8 never required the afterburner because it's implemented inside the generator. Oh. But then the question is that does the, the file carry the, the name like a underscore EB? No, I, it doesn't. Uh, you got to remember that. Hey everyone, have a good afternoon. And drivers, please uh, leave with full cars if you need, uh, you need some people to fill spaces. So let, let folks know and uh, have a good uh, good evening. Enjoy. Yeah. Uh, what time are we, are we meeting here? In what time? Um, Probably, you know, I, I want to make sure everyone's going. Yeah, actually, um, to be ready. 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. 15, 20 minutes. Oh, is that all right? Too early. I'm, not, I'm flexible. I want to want to make sure everyone's yeah. going. Actually, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y